I'm 53 years old. Truth of the matter is, I never pictured being 53. I'm one of those guys I was never in a hurry to grow up. Um, I didn't like junior high school, but that's a whole other story. But I did enjoy high school, and I loved my experience in college. Even those first years in ministry, man, those were exciting times for me. And I think about that first teaching assignment that I had in full-time ministry. I was assigned to teach the adult auditorium class. And this particular class at this particular congregation, I have to tell you that I was pretty sure that there were people in that class that had read their Bible every day for more days than I had been alive. It was intimidating. And I kept wondering, how can I teach people that know so much about God's Word? How could I teach people that were that old? Now, when I look in the mirror, I see a young 53-year-old. Um, some of you may see something different, but to you I would say just wait long enough and you'll experience life just as I am. And you'll hope that you can look at the mirror and think, wow, you sure do look good for that age. Um, there may be some of you that think, man, if I could just be 53 again, Man, look at Johnny, he's all trying to be healthy and running it all. But, you know, I, I'm here in the middle. At least that's what I want to think. Now I realize I probably have more years behind me than I do in front of me, but don't mess up a good sermon illustration, okay? Because I want to think that this is a point in my life that I'm enjoying just some great days. Wonderful memories behind and great opportunities ahead. Now, there are a lot of people who reach a moment at this particular time in life, and they start to question things. And we actually have a term for that. We call it a midlife crisis. We start to ask, what kind of impact have we had? Where have we been? What have we done? And what kind of impact have we had on, on family, on church, and on community? Uh, some of us have a strong desire to make a difference, to leave the world better than we found it. Some of you have made with great success, and you may be growing in your relationship with the Lord. You uh, are invested in the work of the church, and your children are faithful to the Lord. But, but still, many of us have some level of disappointment. Maybe some of you that you never anticipated divorce being part of your story. You really hope that your story would be a happily ever after story. Uh, perhaps your children haven't grown up and, and remained faithful to the Lord. And we've reached a time in life when that happens and we start to ask the question, what could we have done differently? Where did we go wrong. You see, we look around us, and there are others that are getting ready for retirement, but, but we look at how we have handled things financially, and we realize that retirement is something that's just a hope in the future, and even that hope seems so very distant. And then there's the spiritual aspect of life. It's just not what we had pictured. Satan has beaten us up, people have knocked us down, and we just feel defeated. Life and often comes with regrets. When we hit midlife, we begin to ask these questions. Do I have time to turn this around? Can my story end well? And do I still have something to contribute? I have great news for you. Because this morning we're going to look in the Bible. We're looking at three characters this morning. I know when this series unstuck, we've looked primarily at the life of Elijah. But we're going to expand that picture this morning. And what I think we can see is that when we hit moments of crisis in our life, whether it's midlife or otherwise, but when we hit those moments of crisis, understand this, friends. God is still active in writing our story, if we will let Him. And so that's our desire today, is to look and to watch God at work as people have struggled 
through various crises at points in their life. We're going to begin this morning in Genesis chapter 12. We're looking at the story of Abram. And I'm probably going to struggle because I'm so used to saying Abraham, but the majority of this story, his name is still Abram, and his wife's name is still Sarai. And so we're going to look at that, and let's begin with this story in Genesis chapter 12, in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now friends, that's quite a story. Can I remind you, Abram was 75 years old when God approached him in this story in Genesis 12. Man, most of us, if we're 75, if we haven't started planning retirement, we're well into retirement, but not Abram. Abram was just beginning because some of the greatest moments of his life would take place from this day forward. Abram and his wife made their way into Egypt at that time because there was famine in the land. Something interesting happens there, though. We begin to see something about Abram that is really just a a character flaw in him. Rather than approaching the Egyptian leaders and being honest and truthful about who they are, he encouraged his wife Sarai to tell him that she was Abram's sister, not his wife. That deception caused some problems between Abram and the Egyptian leaders. But still, even in that moment of disappointment, even in that moment of setback or failure, God was faithful. God continued to bless him, so much so that by the time we get to Genesis 14, Abram and Lot, that was Abram's nephew, determined to separate and to go their own separate ways. And the reason that they needed to do that was because God had blessed them with such an abundance that it was just going to be easier for them to travel in two separate directions. We know there was a point not far after that that Lot got caught up between a battle, between a war between kings, and and Lot's caught up in that and he's taken away and he and his family are held captive. But Abram comes in and rescues Lot. And so we see life happening. But then when we turn to Genesis 16, one of the things we notice, man, God's made this great promise in Genesis 12. He's blessed Abram by Genesis 14. But when we get in Genesis chapter 16, Scripture tells us, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. As we look at that passage, one of the things that I think about in our life and how that becomes so practical to us is there comes a point in our life where God has this plan and it's set out before us. But so often we want to take matters into our own hands. But you see, God had made a promise to Abram. And he was going to fulfill that promise. In fact, I want us to look and throughout this story, we already know in Genesis 12 where God had made that promise to Abram. But if we look in Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, I want us to to listen to this. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. 
All right, so let's look at this and let's begin to get some perspective here. God had made a promise to Abram. That promise is repeated with detail, with greater detail in chapter 15. By the way, it's repeated again in chapter 17. It's repeated again in chapter 18. Now, Abram had to wait. Sarah had to wait. And by the time that Abraham and Sarah became parents, Abraham was 100 years old. But what we see is that God made a promise to Abram. And in Genesis chapter 21, God fulfilled that promise to Abraham, not just in Genesis 21, but in the chapters and books beyond that time. So God was faithful to His promise, even in this midlife time and with this crisis in Abram's family. God was faithful to the promise that He had made. You see, there can be roadblocks and there can be crisis in life. And some of life's issues, by the way, just occur. It's kind of like that problem with Lot. Lot didn't necessarily do anything wrong to get caught up in that war. Sometimes, though, our problems are self-inflicted like Abram and his problem with deception. By the way, he would repeat that same problem in Genesis chapter 20. But when we trust God to write our story, when those problems are self-inflicted, we repent and we want to get right back on the path that God has laid out for us. And then when those problems, those circumstances come in life, even at those points, friends, even more than ever, we need to be faithful to God, trusting that He is being faithful to us to write our story in a way that blesses us and is according to to His will. Now we're going to turn the page and I want us to look now not at the life of Abram but now at the life of Moses. Then I'm going to suggest to you face two midlife crises, one at the age of 40 and another at the age of 80. By the way, all of those years are covered within just a couple of chapters in the book of Exodus. When we look and we know that Moses is born and it was at a time that the Hebrew children were being killed, those boys particularly. And so we know that was happening and Moses was put in the river. He's taken out of the river by Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses was actually brought up. He was reared in Pharaoh's household. But there was a point when, Abraham, uh, when Moses was about 40 years old. There was a point when he went out one day and there was a Hebrew and Egyptian that were fighting. Moses got involved in that story. And next thing you know, the Egyptian had been killed. And so Moses ran for his life. But Moses found a new beginning in this first mid-life crisis. He came into to Jethro's home and he got a new profession as a shepherd. He was married and he had a family. And so we look at those things and we see how God had blessed him. And so it seems that, you know, Moses is going along and he's saying, well, all is well. It's not necessarily the way life started, but this second stage of life isn't so bad after all. But God still had plans. And when we look in Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, we see how those plans came that involved the Israelites, but also involved Moses. Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, the Bible tells us, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, God speaking here. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now we know Moses' story. And Moses had questions, he had doubts, and, and flat. he just wanted just to turn away and let God give that job to somebody else. But when we look at what God did in presenting this opportunity in the midst of a midlife time for Moses, at the age of 80, and his best days were still before him, man, God can work in us, God can work through us, God can work in our lives in ways that we would have never asked or imagined. And so now let's move to 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's turn to what is actually our story of the month and look at the story of Elijah. 
By this point in our series, we don't need to have much review, do we? We know in 1 Kings chapter 17 that Elijah declared a drought. It's because the Israelites had been unfaithful to the Lord. In chapter 18, uh, Elijah has this great standoff with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And they were just wicked, evil, sinful people. Elijah has this standoff with the prophets of Baal. And Elijah prayed to God and God provided this fire for a sacrifice. And the people of Israel began to turn back to God. And we would look at this point in Elijah's life and we would think that this is this mountaintop experience. But it wasn't. Because when we look at this and we look and we see how things have changed. Remember, Elijah, man, he had challenged the prophets of Baal. He had challenged the Israelites. I love this passage in 1 Kings 18, 21. He said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, follow Him. Now, that's 1 Kings 18. Verse 21, you need to remember that because we're going to come back to that passage in just a moment because it is a critical statement in our story today. And so Elijah had confronted the prophets of Baal and there was this great turn where the Israelites are turning back to God. But Elijah begins to run away. He goes from this mountaintop to this valley and it's all because of Queen Jezebel and one statement. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2, where she made the statement, And may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So Elijah has hit a true midlife crisis. And so we ran away, and we remember this was a rather long journey. But there comes a point where Elijah's in a cave. God's beginning to take care of him, though. We know he's already taking care of him physically by getting some rest and food and water. He's begun to take care of him by asking him just how, how did he feel, Elijah? Well, what are you doing here? And it gave Elijah an opportunity to express his feelings and of how he felt. Man, God got Elijah's attention, didn't he? With that strong wind, with the earthquake, and then also with the fire. But when God spoke, it was that holy, gentle whisper that brought Elijah from inside the cave to the mouth of the cave. And then when Elijah began to have to deal with some of these false beliefs because God dealt with that, he specifically was telling him and reminding him that he he had relationships and they were going to be important. It was going to be a community of believers. It was going to be a group of colleagues that would say, I've got your back. And then there would be a confidant, Elisha, one that would follow Elijah and would become the prophet that would follow Elijah. And so we see that. But I want us to to focus in this morning on one verse. Actually, it's just part of a verse. The Lord said to Elijah, go back the way you came. And here's why I think that's important for us, is God's telling Elijah, you can go back the way you came. You can deal with the problems that you've run away from. You can deal with the people. You can deal with those circumstances. Elijah, you don't have to run away. You can face these problems because you're not facing them alone. God had promised that He would not leave him or forsake him. And and he's just doing that very thing. But there's this large community of people that have never bowed down to Baal. God said there were 7,000 that had not. And then he names off these three colleagues that are going to be helping Elijah to take care of business. Then he has that confidant, Elisha. And so we look at that and we see that Elijah no longer had to run away. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Friends, we need to hear this because we don't always have to run away from our problems. Now, there's a time when we need to flee temptation. That is an entirely different lesson in itself. But we don't have to run away from our problems. Great example here from Elijah. Now, I want to do something as we get ready to close today. And that's where I want us to look and to connect something 
particular about the story of Abram, of Moses, and of Elijah. And in doing so, I need to go back and look at another passage. It's in the book of Joshua. That Joshua looks back, this is a historical moment where he's looking back at the people of Israel. But I want us to hear what he had to say. This is Joshua 24, beginning in verse 2. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived between the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him through Canaan and gave him many descendants. All right, can you remember that? Now we're going to move down to Joshua 24, beginning in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Friends, that's a powerful statement. And I want us to take us straight to this quote. It's from an author, Mark Job, because I think he puts this in a great way, and then we'll develop this a little more before we finish. Mark Job says, One of the greatest challenges for every generation of God followers is not allowing the image of God to be reshaped and downsized by their contemporary culture. In Elijah's day, Israel's problem was not that they had rejected God altogether, but they had added Him to their assortments of God. Man, I want you to think about that. Think about what he has just said here. And then what we've read in the book of Joshua. Because we look back to the day of Abraham. And Abraham lived at a time when people in his area were worshiping other gods. Abraham had to make a decision to follow the Lord God Almighty. Moses lived in a day and time where there were people that were worshiping the Israelites, that were worshiping the Egyptian gods. Moses had to make a decision to follow the Lord God Almighty. And then we know from our study this month that Elijah lived in a day and time that the people of Israel had begun to follow and to worship false gods, particularly the false god Baal. But Elijah made a decision to follow God and to worship Him and to follow Him. Man, that is so critical for us to see. One more thought from Job. It's where Mark Job says, God was being reduced to a pocket-sized rabbit foot to help people in their time of need. He says, each generation must decide what we will do with God. The Lord has no desire to be on a list of gods in our lives. He doesn't want a place in our lives. He wants us. Oh, I think that is a critical message for us because we live in a day and time where there are people that are turning away from the Lord and, and we're worshiping idols. You, you see, that's, that's religious terminology, but we're not doing a good job of translating it and recognizing it in the world around us. When we begin to follow money, get caught up in material things, we've created an idol. We're worshiping a false god. When we want to be popular, when we begin to look at these other things that society is getting caught up in, and when we start to get caught up in those things, we are doing the very same thing that we've just read about in the era of Abraham, of Moses, and of Elijah. 
Friends, I'm becoming more convinced each day I live that history continues to repeat itself. And we a people are being so arrogant and so ignorant and just so selfish that we are not stopping to recognize that we could learn from these stories in history. We do not have to repeat the same mistakes that others and generations before us have made. But unfortunately, I see us doing that. And so we have come to a point and a day and a time where we need to ask this, whatever the crisis may be in our life, we need to start and we need to ask this question, man, is the Lord in my life? And by saying that, it's not just is the Lord one of a list of many things that are important to me. Because you see, God doesn't want a place on the shelf. God doesn't want a room in our house. God doesn't want to be part of our schedule one hour or one day a week. God wants us. God wants full allegiance. He wants us. We, friends, we need to be asking ourselves this question. Am I fully committed to the Lord? So when I find myself in times of crisis, whether it's midlife or otherwise, whether it's self-inflicted or it's a circumstance that's happening in life, the two questions I need to continue to ask, learning these lessons from Abraham, Moses, and Elijah, they're this. One, where is the Lord in my life? Is He one of many things? Is it like I'm using Him and keeping Him in my pocket just because, you know, if I really need Him, I can pray to Him? Or is it this, am I fully committed to the Lord? Oh, friends, we need to ask that question. And I believe when we ask that, and when we answer that properly, and we turn to the Lord, and we follow Him, we walk by faith, not by sight. But when we listen to the Lord, and when the Lord says go, we go. And we go where He leads us. And it's at those times that He will pull us from being stuck. He'll pull us out of that pit. He'll pull us out of that circumstance in life and He'll put us out of that stinking attitude that we talked about a couple of weeks ago and He will lead us in a way that honors Him, that pleases Him and that will bless our lives.